population. Those 80 and over will grow from 53.1 million in 1990 to 138 million in 2025. Let's look at the implications of an aging population in just one country, Japan. Japan is aging more rapidly than any other nation. In 1965, there were only 153 Japanese who were 100 years old or older. Today, there are 10,158. By the year 2015, the median age in Japan is expected to rise to 45. At that time, Japan will become the oldest society in the history of man. Japan's 65 and over population, now about 12, uh, 15 percent of its population, is expected to grow to 25 percent in 2020. Japan's domestic economy and public policy increasingly will be affected by the demands of its elder population. It may need to double the tax rate on basic earnings to pay for old age pensions. Long term, the world economy will be negatively impacted as Japan has less money to invest outside its borders. In short, other nations, as in Japan, will experience the aging of populations, and that will alter every aspect of domestic life, from health care to consumer spending to recreation. The ninth trend is that water scarcity will create increasing global tensions. The New York Times recently published a dramatic article entitled Water, Pushing the Limits of an Irreplaceable Resource that outlines the pressures on global water supplies. The facts are sobering by any standards. To begin with, an infinitesimally small quantity of water supports life on Earth, less than 1% of the water on the planet. A full 97.5% of our water is salt water in the oceans and the seas. Most of the remaining 2.5 percent is locked up in glaciers and ice caps. And yet growth in population, industrialization, and urbanization have increased our dependency on water worldwide. Human use of water has grown almost eightfold this century. Approximately 1.3 billion people in developing countries do not have access to safe water. Almost four billion have no access to sanitation or sewage services. According to the World Health Organization, almost half of the people of the world suffer from waterborne or water-related diseases. The World Resources Institute has estimated that by the year 2050, 13 to 50 percent of the world's people will be living in water-scarce countries, mostly in the Middle East and Africa. But all countries face pockets of scarcity due to drought and limited supply for a variety of reasons. The World Bank estimates that a number of countries will be too dry to maintain recent rates of water use in the face of population growth demands in 2025. Others will need to increase supply or reduce consumption. The politics of water may increase tensions around the globe. According to French President Jacques Chirac, the United Nations has identified 70 areas from the Near East to the Sahel drylands of Latin America and the Indian subcontinent in which armed conflict may break out because of contested water supplies. The risk of conflict will grow in step with the depletion of resources. According to Tony Allen, a water expert at the University of London, 
the Middle East actually ran out of water in 1972, when the region drew more water out of its aquifers and rivers than the rains were replenishing. The question he goes on to ask is, are we going to allow the 21st century to be the century of the water wars? Even in the developed world, water increasingly will become an issue. A nationalist lobbying group in Canada wants to keep drinking water away from American entrepreneurs. The Council of Canadians says the federal government must ban the export of vital fresh water. Sunbelt Water of California has tried unsuccessfully to bring super tankers filled with Canadian water into California. Those opposed to the arrangement want to protect Canada's natural resource, which is about one quarter of the world's fresh water supply. The tenth trend that is shaping the 21st century is growing world illiteracy. According to a recent study published by UNICEF, nearly one-sixth of the 5.9 billion people in the world cannot read or write. In addition, the report says that illiteracy has a direct relationship to health indicators and fertility rates. For example, in Brazil, the report found that illiterate women have an average of 6.5 children and others with secondary school educations have an average of 2.5 children. The study predicts that illiteracy rates will steadily grow into the next century because only one of every four children in the poorest nations is now in school. As a result, the economic divide will increase between rich, computerized countries and those with populations without even basic skills. Taken together, the ten trends shaping the 21st century paint a picture of a future made up of two conflicting worlds. One of infinite possibility, the other of futility. One filled with promise because of breakthroughs in science and technology, the other impeded by the brick walls of social, demographic, and environmental obstacles in the developing and developed worlds alike. It is as though all of our collective energies are being spent finding solutions to a certain set of palatable problems, while others, much less desirable, are given scant attention or have been given up on altogether. And yet, the negative trends threaten to overtake us because their implications are more far-reaching, and they are growing the fastest. The urgent needs of the third world may overtake the complacency of the first world in an age of increasing global interdependency. So this is the point at which organizational and individual responsibility enter the picture. The 21st century will demand the creation and proliferation of a whole new category of organization, the Global Interest Corporation, an international business and development model only now possible because of the new global economy. In the past, companies that conducted business internationally were not really global. They may have sold their products internationally, but they exhibited no overriding sense of global responsibility or even the need to have one. 
Moreover, few, if any, demands were placed upon them to behave responsibly, either by the governments of the nations in which they operated, or by the consumers they served. By contrast, as part of their mission, GICs will address the challenge of reshaping global society, bridging the gap between the most promising and the most limiting trends of the next century, directly through the international economy. They will set out to solve the world's problems through the marketplace. For example, they will be at the forefront of finding ways cheaply to increase and purify water supplies through a variety of technologies. They will address the health care needs of the elderly. They will pioneer the discovery and application of new sources of energy. They will harness the power of science and technology directly to mitigating the world's most persistent social problems and inequities. That must be the overriding business agenda for the 21st century. It is crucial that global interest corporations be for-profit entities. Societal problems, the negative trends that I have observed, as well as a host of other related ones, persist because there has never been an economic benefit associated with satisfying them. So governments and nonprofit foundations and organizations have been left with the responsibility to tackle them without needing to benefit materially from doing so, which is at best usually a formula for ineffectiveness. By contrast, global interest corporations we'll have both the responsibility and the incentive. Think of them as hybrids between governmental agencies, not-for-profit foundations, and international corporations. They will function as businesses, but they will adopt goals that include achieving worthy social purposes not as byproducts of their activities, not as gestures of generosity, but as their prime motivation for being in business. In exchange for their activities on behalf of society around the globe, they may be given generous tax advantages or they may be exempted from taxation altogether. The exact structure that puts the incentive into their developing or discovering solutions to the world's most pressing problems may vary. The desired result needs to be the same. The goal of the 21st century must be to bridge the gap between the most promising and the most distressing trends of the 21st century. To raise the standard of living and quality of life throughout the world. The long-term prosperity of the global economy is at stake. For there to be a successful international marketplace, there has to be more than just a better distribution of wealth worldwide. There has to be genuine, sustained, global economic development. That will only come about if the world economy is driven less by the sale and exchange of consumer goods and more by the creation of meaningful social infrastructure. Knowing the ten trends that will shape the future brings with it the inescapable responsibility to transform the way 
we work and conduct business in order to create a better world. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Goldstein. Let us continue with the second question and answer session. Our first question is a fax from uh, Mexico. It is from La Cervecería Cuauhtémoc Moctezuma in the city of Monterrey in the state of Nuevo León in Mexico. And it asked the question uh, relating back to uh, Dr. Lloyd's presentation that if women have a natural sense of responsibility more so than their male counterparts shouldn't more of our leaders be women what's your response well I think the simple answer to that is yes there's certainly quite a lot of evidence to suggest that if you look at the literature um, about the family and about uh, areas that women have been traditionally involved in the word responsibility is used much more extensively than the word power but of course if you put women into if they're employed in power driven organizations it's very likely that the culture that they will end up by exhibiting will be a power driven one and uh, there's some evidence to suggest that uh, our recent prime ministerial experience in that direction reflects this. So it's, there isn't a simple answer, but certainly there is a very good case for having many more women in positions of responsibility in society. Dr. Goldstein, do you accept the premise that women are no, more I responsible? No, I don't. I just think that it's, um, uh, I mean, it's nice to be able to kind of, you know, swoop a, a premise in there. I, I don't think it's been proven that women are, are more um, capable or more responsible for leadership. So I'll just have to say uh, uh, my answer is uh, just dependent upon a little bit more uh, concrete evidence. Our next question is from Mexico. It is from La Universidad Tecnológica de Nezahualcoyotl in the city of Nezahualcoyotl in the state of Mexico in Mexico. The question is the following. To create uh, strategic policies before redesigning our organizational structures and decentralizing the decision-making process as well as delegation of responsibilities, do you think that would be a good alternative to face the challenges of the future? Yes, in general I do. I think, in fact, that is not only a good idea, it is an idea whose time has come as a result of uh, information technology and the availability of it. Uh, that is what is uh, in the wind uh, bureaucratically and organizationally. Thank you. Our next question is also from Mexico. It is from La Comisión Federal de Electricidad, La División Golfo Norte, which is in the city of Monterrey in the state of Nuevo León in Mexico. Okay, we had a, uh, a bad connection. We'll take our next call from Costa Rica, from the, again, from the Centro Costarricense de Ciencia y Cultura in the city, the capital of San Jose in Costa Rica. And it refers to the greater accumulation of wealth by countries and organizations or even ind individuals. What would you recommend the countries and companies with less uh, resources? And what expectations do you have regarding the consequences of this accumulation of wealth in, in few hands? Well, I think everybody, if I'm following this correctly, it is how um, 
companies uh, can, as I suggested, become global interest corporations and those who may have more and those who may have less, what, what they may be able to do. The important thing, I think, is for people to adopt strategies that are appropriate to their level of organizational strength and to reorient themselves towards what would be broader markets and the greater good. Uh, without that, we are traveling in um, dissecting lines. And at the same time, we are also um, headed uh, uh, on a collision course. You cannot continue to foster consumer, uh, rampant consumerism on a global um, um, level um, uh, unless there is an appropriate infrastructure within uh, the social and the economic structures throughout the world. Thank you. Our next question is from Mexico. Uh, again, from the state of Nuevo León, is from PEMSA in the city of Monterrey, in Nuevo León, Mexico. Okay. My question is for the two speakers: What should we do with a leader who is showing, with its attitude, a, a, a refuses to see the future and wants to? keep rooted in the past in order to not move forward and to avoid conflicts. Get rid of them. Would you like Get to rid see? of them. I don't care where the leader is. Um, leaders are, have to lead and people have to empower those leaders. Um, that's the nature of existence. That's the nature of change. To go back to the very first question that we posed, people are afraid of change and will often put up with degrees of, um, of burdensome, uh, oppressive situations, um, uh, knowing, again, uh, the truth of things. So you have to uh, uh, allow people to change, and if they don't change, then you have to um, help them change. Go ahead, Dr. Lloyd. The simple answer, of course, is to uh, vote them out if you have that opportunity. And if that uh, situation doesn't uh, prevail, in the country, and it's not as easy in all countries to do this, um, I would suggest that uh, a lot of people start reading the works of Gandhi and exploring alternative ways of removing people who are pursuing, using power to pursue their own personal interests. Thank you. Our next question is from Bolivia. It is from La Universidad Privada Boliviana in Cochabamba, Bolivia. Good afternoon. Change in innovation will reduce the employment of um, labor work, workforce, and that will mean more unemployment. Demographics in the world ha is, is rapidly increasing. What, is, what would be the rec recommendable formula for the world population to continue to survive faced with changes and innovations? Not all change has to be at the expense of individuals. It is true, for example, uh, that there are corporations that uh, in the name of increased efficiencies and in use of technology will reduce labor forces. But I think we will also see as part of the total package of the future a redefinition of what it may be to work, a redefinition of what it may be to be responsible members of a society. And I don't think that we have to think the worst is going to be the outcome, um, a displacement of, of people. I think the whole world is changing in such a way that there will be a ways to capture um, human power, uh, society's power, uh, without displacing it with technology. Our next question, uh, we've now made contact with, in Mexico, with La Comisión Federal de Electricidad, La División Golfo Norte, which is in the city of Monterrey, in the state of Nuevo León, Mexico. The question is for Dr. Goldstein. How do you visualize the future of Mexico at the threshold of the 21st century? I really can't speak about a, a, a specific country other than the one I know best, the United States. So I would simply say that the ingredients that I have identified in those ten trends, uh, I believe, pertain to most, if not all, countries in the world. And I would suggest that it's probably better for others who are closer to the situation to see how those things apply. I think this may be our last question. It's one from Mexico. It's from El Colegio de Bachilleres, Estado de Sinaloa 
en Guamuchel, Sinaloa, México. Good morning. The new world economy model is based on the development of science and technology. Will this help in the distribution of production, particularly in emerging technology economies that still depend on the technologies of the first world countries? And also, the I would like you to comment on the new concept of what is the tailor-made organization or how that will operate. Well, tailor-made organizations are those that uh, largely do uh, in, put in practice to, uh, what Dr. Lloyd had referred to, and that is a sense of responsibility both to the individuals they serve and the individuals who work for them. So those organizations are more flexible than uh, what we normally associate with uh, industrial corporations. Thank you for your excellent questions. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Thank you again, Dr. Lloyd. Dr. Goldstein. We hope that you have enjoyed participating in this video conference. The International Training Center will continue transmitting programs on topics crucial to improving our productivity and global competitiveness. We invite you to participate in our March 18, 1999 program entitled Trends in Certification, the Emergence of International Standards to Support Competitiveness. For additional information on the International Training Center's programs for the coming year, please consult your participants' manual, where you will find the dates and specific topics for each program. Also, if you are interested in participating in training programs, which will be offered by the International Training Center, please contact the center by letter, phone, fax, or email. On behalf of all of us who collaborate with the International Training Center, I thank you for your participation and interest in today's program. Thank you. See you again soon.